and welcome to part four of the bloody tour of the York Walls. As usual, I'm your guide, Mad Alice, and hopefully you've already tuned in to parts one, two, and three, where we visited Micklegate Bar, Bootham Bar, Monk Bar, and now here we're at our final stop, Warmgate Bar. We're going to continue our journey from Warmgate Bar to the very beginning, Micklegate Bar. And on this episode, I have a lot more to show you, particularly some of the darker characters of York's history. So, welcome back, sit back, relax, and enjoy our next adventure. So welcome to Warm Gate Bar. This is one of the most complete of the four gateways of the city. And it's a real mismatch of different centuries as well. The stone archways actually date from the 12th century. The barbican at the front dates from the 14th century. The oak doors here are 15th century. And you can see this timber framed building was added during the reign of Elizabeth I in the 16th century. But you can see, if you come a bit closer, just how thick these wooden oak doors are. This was your defence system. There was no getting through these gateways if the enemy was trying to get inside. But just in case the doors did fail, first defence was actually the portcullis. You can just about see the spikes peering out up there. But when I say that this is the most complete gateway, I mean it's because of this, what we call the Barbican. Now the Barbican would have been attached to all three of the other gateways, but this is the only one still standing, even though it does bear the battle marks of the Siege of York in 1644. But what would happen here is that there was actually another gateway here, which was the first line of defense. So imagine if the enemy was able to breach the outer gateway, they would then flood into this Barbican area. And hopefully the portcullis and the inner door would be shut, essentially trapping them in this box. That would give the guards time to run around on all three sides and they'd be able to hurl anything they had to hand at their enemies below. Imagine arrows being rained down at their enemies. Imagine great big boulders big enough to crush a man's skull. It was even noted that boiling hot oil or tar would be poured onto the poor suffering victims below. Not a place you want to get stuck in at all. The English Civil War ravaged the country between 1642 and 1646. Supporters of Parliament rebelled against the tyrannical rule of Charles I. England as a nation was divided. The parliamentarians or roundheads were led by Oliver Cromwell and they controlled much of the south of the country. The royalists in support of the king were based up in the north of England. York was seen as the key gateway to accessing the rest of the Northern Territory. The parliamentarian forces surrounded the city on the 22nd of April in 1644. The siege of York had begun. 4,000 royalist troops stationed themselves within the city walls and they were captained by the Earl of Newcastle. On the outside of the city walls, 30,000 of Cromwell's men took up arms, captained by Lord Fairfax. Their plan of action was to starve the city out. But we Yorkies are rather resourceful and with two major rivers running through the city, that was our water supply. We'd harvested the crops in the surrounding areas. We had mills producing flour to make baked goods. We had breweries, we know all about breweries, and that kept us topped up. And so the parliamentarian forces had a long wait ahead of them, 11 weeks in total. By this time, the Scots had come to help the parliamentarian troops. They stationed themselves on the south of the River Ouse, 
Lord Fairfax and his army controlled the area of the south of the Ouse round to the Foss. And the Earl of Newcastle had joined the fight on the north of the River Ouse. After weeks of waiting, the Parliamentarian forces decided to be a little bit more proactive and in June started making attacks on this gateway here. The evidence of it is still visible out the front. These are the actual impressions left by the cannonballs of Lord Fairfax's army. They also had the idea that they would dig a tunnel under Warngate Bar, fill it with gunpowder and explode it from underneath. But fortunately for the Royalists, the foot soldier that was tasked with this job was actually captured. After torturing him, he confessed their plans and revealed the secret entrance to the tunnel. The Royalists, discovering the gunpowder, quickly flooded it just in time. That plan was dead in the water, so to speak. It wasn't until the 2nd of July in 1644 that the Royalists suffered a major defeat. At the Battle of Marsden Moor, seven miles west of York, Lord Fairfax and his Parliamentarian army were able to defeat the Royalist stronghold. The Royalists left the city on the 16th of July, 1644. They exited through Micklegate Bar with their heads hung low. By this point, Warngate Bar was nothing but a ruin. Lord Fairfax, once considered the enemy of the city, was now made Governor of York by Parliament. He quickly regained the trust of the citizens when he stopped the marauding Scots and religious zealots from plundering and looting the city's churches. He was hailed as the hero of York Minster as he stopped his troops from destroying all the stained glass. He's now honoured today inside York Minster with a special plaque. So let's begin our journey from Warngate Bar round to Micklegate Bar with a few stops in between. Just behind this hotel here in 2008, there was a big archeological dig. They actually discovered the skeletons of 113 men. They ranged from the ages of about 20 to about 50. They were seemingly strong as well. And they were discovered in a total of 10 mass graves, but they weren't just flung in. They're actually carefully placed there. And it turned out that these graves have actually been placed within the boundaries of a church that would have stood there until the 1580s. But carbon dating of these skeletons revealed that these skeletons belonged to the 17th century. Immediately, the experts believed that these could have been part of the parliamentary forces of Lord Fairfax at the Siege of York in 1644. He basically recruited about 30,000 individuals from the local area. But the trouble with these skeletons was that there was no obvious signs of why they'd been buried in the first place. There was no signs of trauma associated with battle. There was no obvious signs of disease at first either. But further analysis of the bones proves that these soldiers actually died from typhus, a deadly disease known as jail fever because it spread in close proximities. It would begin with very much flu-like symptoms, a fever, a headache, a cough. But within a matter of days, it would spread throughout the body, creating a rash. You develop light sensitivity, delirium. In some cases, you could end up in a coma. But in all cases, if left untreated, it would eventually lead to death. Of course, there was no cure for it back in the day. But of all these skeletons, two were rather distinct in themselves. The first skeleton, an older gentleman, seemed to have the bones of his hand fused, so it wouldn't have been that much of an issue. The second man, however, was not so fortunate. His left arm was actually fused at a 90 degree angle by the elbow. His opposite leg fused at the knee, also at a right angle. He certainly couldn't have been part of the foot soldiers that would have stormed the city. But it's possible that he was there in another capacity to help the army. A cook, a medic, a number of things, but possibly not a foot soldier. Now it's rare to find such congenital deformities in one in thousands of people, let alone to find two people with the same disfigurement in a camp of 113. Tests on the teeth revealed 
that these men actually shared a similar diet of more fish than was usual at the time. So it's thought that they actually came from the same community on the coast somewhere. Possibly they were related, but unfortunately the DNA analysis couldn't prove that. Who these two figures were remains a mystery to this day. You come off the wall here at Fishergate Bar, which actually did used to be one of the main entrances to the city. In fact, it's even mentioned as early as 1315. But in 1489, the gateway was attacked by rebellions against King Henry VII. And you can see the remnants of this attack when they tried to burn it down. Here, you can see the red brickwork from that attack. Of course, it fell into a state of disrepair and the authorities decided that it was actually cheaper rather than to rebuild it and have it manned with a watchman they would actually just brick it up and it remained bricked up until the 1800s but as you can see now you can walk right back into the city centre but let's continue our journey After you get back on the wall at Fishergate Bar, you come round to Fishergate Poston Tower, which was a watchtower rebuilt in around about the 1500s. Fishergate Poston Tower is actually open certain days of the year, so you might be lucky enough to even have a sneak peek inside. But after William the Conqueror dammed the River Foss, this area was actually underwater, and it did actually used to lap up to the base of this tower, which is why just around the corner, there's something quite amusing. This is the guardmaster's own personal privy. So they would sit on the toilet up there and it would immediately just drop down into the dirty, murky waters below. That was a risk, but fortunately no one's using it today. So just up from Fishergate Poston, take this road here and you'll see St George's Church just across the way. And just opposite the church, there's an interesting feature around here, St George's Graveyard. Now it's worth a look in, it's usually always open, because there's a rather interesting gravestone in here. You can see that all the graves are sort of sunken into the ground, but there is one just at the very back, which just seems to stand out more than the others. And this is because it's a rather famous character associated with the city. Let's have a look. And here he is, Mr. Richard Turpin, also known as Dick Turpin, famous highwayman who terrorised the country in the early 18th century. He was actually executed in York at the Knavesmire in 1739. And although we don't actually know if he's really buried here, he's certainly buried somewhere in the vicinity. You see, this grave marker actually doesn't appear until 1918. So the legend still surrounds him to this day. But what do we know of Dick Turpin? Well, he was this dashing gentleman highwayman, made the lady swoon, stand and deliver your money or your life. Yeah, he actually wasn't any of that. He was about five foot five, stocky build, butcher by trade, from Essex originally, so had a dodgy accent, and uh, was badly scarred by smallpox, so definitely not the looker. And as for making the lady swoon, well, they didn't so much swoon as scream and faint. He was an absolute brute back in the day. He was born in 1705 at Hempstead, Essex, and he was a butcher by trade originally. But fairly soon he fell in with the Gregory gang, 
the notorious nasty gang that terrorised the countryside. In fact, there's a really nasty story that the gang attacked a farmhouse that was run by an elderly couple. They beat the husband to within an inch of his life and they held the wife over the fire, burning her posterior until she'd actually tell them where the money was hidden in the house. So really nasty, brutish character. Eventually got into trouble when he actually shot and killed one of his fellow gang members, a Tom King. And as such, he was now wanted for murder. So he went on the run and came up to East Yorkshire where he actually changed his name to John Palmer, which is actually mentioned on the grave header here. Now, although he tried to escape his uh, notorious past, it did actually catch up with him soon enough. And in Beverly, he got into a bit of a spat where he shot a chicken and threatened to shoot somebody else. So for this, he was arrested for disturbing the peace. And they quickly realized that actually he'd done more than just shot a chicken. He'd actually been stealing horses, which in the 18th century was a capital offence. As such, he was actually brought here to the York courts, which were the biggest courts in the land. And he was incarcerated in the prison, which is in the Castle Prison or the York Castle Museum today. And this is where things take a funny turn, because at this point, the authorities didn't know who they'd actually captured. They just assume it was a nobody, a Mr. John Palmer. But John Palmer, whilst he was waiting for his trial, decided he would write a letter to his brother-in-law who lived down in Essex. So he wrote the letter and he sent it off. But this is before the postal system that we have nowadays. Nowadays, if we write a letter, we have to pay for the stamp, stick it on, send it off. Back then, it was the receiver of the letter that would actually have to pay for the delivery charge. So when the letter arrived at the postmaster's office down in Essex, the gentleman who the letter was addressed to was summoned for and he was asked to pay for the missing stamp. This gentleman took one look at the postal mark of York. He said, I don't know anyone in York. Actually, he was in Essex, so he had a dodgy accent. Hang on. <clears throat> I don't know anyone in York. I ain't going to pay for this letter. You can keep it, yeah? So the letter remained with the postmaster, who grew very suspicious about the handwriting. So he opened up the letter, now had a bit of a read, said, I know this person. By sheer coincidence, I taught this person how to write at school. This is not the handwriting of a John Palmer, which is why no one's ever heard of him. This is, in fact, the handwriting of that notorious and most wanted criminal, Dick Turpin. Well, the authorities couldn't believe what a celebrity they had languishing in their midst who they'd managed to capture through, let's face it, sheer dumb luck. Now, nowadays, we know Turpin to be this famous highwayman robber. That's not actually the charge that they got him on. They got him for two charges of horse stealing. Yeah, it, it does sound like an anticlimax with the exciting story that we've just been through. But as I mentioned, in the 18th century, horse stealing is a hanging crime. So on the 7th of April, 1739, Turpin was taken from the condemned man's cell at the castle prison and was paraded through the streets in an open horse and cart. He went out Micklegate Bar and out towards the gallows, the three-legged mare based over on the race course. There a huge crowd had actually gathered to see this famous highwayman being hanged. And actually, his hangman was actually a pardoned highwayman himself, Thomas Hadfield. And they actually had a bit of a chat when he got up onto the scaffold. So the noose was placed about his neck and he began to climb up the ladder. It said with undaunted courage, he looked about him and noticing his right leg tremble, spoke a few words to the topsman before he threw himself off the ladder thus expiring in about five minutes. The crowd went wild. This was a really good family fun day out for them all. His body was then taken down and actually put on display in a local pub. It was actually put on display at the Blue Boar Inn on Castlegate. So you could pay a few shillings to see the body of this famous highwayman. And then he was eventually brought here to the churchyard of St. George's. He actually didn't stay buried for very long body snatchers actually stole the body and tried to sell it to a local surgeon who was known for doing illegal dissections on bodies. 
But the local mob caught wind of this and they quickly stormed the surgeon's house demanding the body back. They reburied it in a secret location, covered it with quicklime so that nobody else could steal the body. So it is somewhere here. I doubt it's actually underneath here though. Somewhere in the vicinity. But there are a lot of legends about Dick Turpin. This famous highwayman robber, this dashing gentleman, had a famous steed called Black Bess that he used to ride about in. Did the famous ride from London to York in a day, which was unheard of at the time. Well, to be honest, that didn't happen. He actually didn't have a horse called Black Bess, because remember what he was hanged for in the first place. He was actually hanged for horse stealing. Never had his own horses. And the legendary ride from London to York had actually been performed in 1676 by another highwayman, a William Neverson, who's actually hanged over at the Knavesmire as well. So Richard Turpin, Dick Turpin, famous highwayman, notorious in this country. Is he here? Is he over there? Who knows? To find the walls again, you leave Fishergate Poston, come over the bridge over the River Foss, and then look to your right hand side, you will see this wall here. Now these are actually the city walls, these are the boundary walls of York Castle. The castle is just on the other side, and these walls date from the 14th century to enclose the area. You can just continue across the bridge and start on the walls again, or you can take a closer look at York Castle. would have led to the condemned man's cell. The condemned man or woman would have been paraded from this door across the street and taken to the gallows over in St George's Field. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the executions that took place there in the 1800s in a moment but for now I'm going to take you around the corner to one of the most historic and iconic sites of York, Clifford's Tower. Clifford's Tower, also known as York Castle. It was one of two castles actually built by William the Conqueror when he arrived here in 1068. The second castle is actually just on the other side of the river over at Bale Hill. But that castle has all long disappeared. And this is all that remains of the castle nowadays. And this is the Mott and Bailey. It was sort of a lookout point. I know what you're thinking, as a castle, it's slightly on the smaller side. But this was the highest point of the castle and the castle actually would have expanded in all this area here. So you've seen the castle walls at the back. The original structure was actually built of wood back when William the Conqueror was here, but unfortunately it burned down in a fire just one year later. So they decided they would rebuild it in wood. Guess what happened, burned down. So they rebuilt it again in wood and actually it was blown away by a great gale. So for the final time in the 13th century, they decided they would rebuild it in stone with a wooden roof. What do you think happened to the roof? Burnt down. Technically, it actually blew up in 1684 when celebrations on top of the roof of St George's Day went a little bit wrong with the gun salute. Never mind. York Castle has been used for a variety of things over the years. It was used as a garrison during the Civil War. It was also used as the Royal Mint at one point. And in the 16th century, it was used as the city's prison. And while it was used as a prison, it was run by the constabulary family known as the Cliffords. So it might be their name that has stuck. But we also know that in 1322, the second Baron de Clifford was hanged in chains from its walls for rebelling against King Edward II at the time. So it might be his name that has stuck. But this is also the site of one of the darkest chapters in York history. In the year 1190, 150 men, women and children of the Jewish community here in York lost their lives within the confines of the castle. You see, they were being persecuted by the Christians. The Christians were blaming the Jews for this country's financial problems. So they decided they would wipe out the entire Jewish population up and down the country. 
riots were everywhere. News of particularly bad riots down in London reached the ears of the Jews here in York, so many of them gathered together all their belongings and fled in fear from the city, never to return. But 150 men and women barricaded themselves inside York Castle and they waited for help to arrive. That help never came. Already, the angry Christians had began to gather at the base of the mound. And one day, a monk that was praying for peace between these two feuding religions was somehow struck by a falling stone from the battlements and was killed instantly. This incited the Christians even more. They thought this was an act of rebellion from those inside and they weren't going to stand for it. So with flaming torches in hand, they were going to storm up the castle steps, break down the door and kill every man, woman and child within. The Jews inside heard about this, decided they weren't going to die at the hands of the Christians, they would rather take their own lives. Ten men were given the horrendous task to slit the throats of their wives and children. By the time that angry mob had broken down the door and got inside, there were only two men still alive left within. There were bodies and blood everywhere. Those two men were then dragged out by the scruff of the neck and put to death at the base of the mound. So it is a horrific massacre that we still remember to this day on its anniversary on the 16th of March, the events that happened in the year 1190. Clifford's Tower is now owned by English Heritage, so it is open to the public. And although it's got no roof, that actually adds to the advantage because you can still go up to the top and get 360 degree views of the city of York. But this is a really good place to actually come and look down and look at the three fine Georgian buildings just across the way. They surround the patch of land that was known as the Eye of York. And the building which is the oldest is the one with the clock tower in the centre that was built in 1704 as the county jail. It was also known as the debtor's prison, so if you earned any money, you'd have to languish in a prison cell in there until you could pay the money back. Which sort of defeats the object if you're incarcerated, you can't go out and work, you can't pay back the debt. Basically, you're stuffed. Don't get yourself in that situation in the first place. The building to the right hand side was built in the 1760s and was built as the Crown Court and is actually still used as the Crown Court to this day. You can see Justice herself holding the scales just at the top there. And the final building to make up the trio is over on the left hand side and it's the exact mirror image of the Crown Court. That is the female prison that was built in the 1780s. But nowadays it's the female prison and the county jail that now make up the York Castle Museum, which I highly recommend that you visit. And in fact, it's inside the female prison where you see the recreation of the Victorian street. But it's in the county jail where countless criminals were incarcerated, including our Dick Turpin as well. And from here, they would be placed in the condemned man's cell awaiting their time to go to the gallows either at St George's Field just across the way or out to the Knavesmire at the Tyburn. across the way from Clifford's Tower you've got this lovely little garden called the Tower Gardens obviously because it's in the shadow of the towers but just as you come through the gateway take a look at this this is the level of all the floods that we've had in the city they've actually missed one off in 2015 we almost got up to the line of the 2000 marker there as well that was the last bad flood that we had because every year the river in York floods and every year it's a big surprise, I don't understand. But it's mainly the River Ouse just down here, which is the one that floods. The Ouse being the word for river, as I mentioned in the first episode, so it's technically called River River. But it's a nice little sun trap area around here, you can bring a picnic, there's a cafe just over in the corner. And although it looks nice and serene nowadays, it actually had a darker history. You see, not too far from where we're standing now, was actually the site of the 19th century gallows.
1811, the Luddite Rebellion began and quickly spread throughout the country. You see, at the beginning of the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution was taking hold and it was the textile mills up and down the country that were seeing the biggest change. They began to introduce the mechanical loom to actually weave all the cloth. As such, many workers were laid off and so began the Luddites. They actually take their name from possibly a fictional character known as Ned Ludd, who apparently destroyed one of these mechanical looms and was beaten by his master. As such, he's became this symbolic figure that the rebels used, and so they became known as the Luddites. In 1812, February 1812, there was introduced a new law. It was called the Frame Breaking Act. It now became a capital offence to destroy one of these mechanical looms. But this didn't subdue the rebellions at all. In fact, it made tensions worse. And just two months later, in April of 1812, the textile mill at Rawfold in North Yorkshire was attacked by 64 men. They were quickly rounded up and put in the castle prison. At the trial, 24 men were convicted of the crime of attacking the mill and murdering the mill owner. What would happen next was that 17 men were sentenced to hang. The rest were subjected to transportation over to the new colonies. And on the 8th of January, the first of the executions began here in St. George's Field. Nowadays, it's just a mandatory car park. It doesn't look like much, but this will be the site of one of the greatest executions in York's history. On the first day, on the 8th of January, three men were hanged right here, including the ringleader of the group, George Miller, who was actually solely convicted for the murder of the mill owner. A large crowd had gathered that what the authorities decided to do was actually raise the scaffold so that everybody could have a clear view. They wanted to send a clear message. Because there were so many people, two troops of cavalry were actually brought in to try and subdue the crowds and to make sure that there was no attempt of an escape by these convicted criminals. They were led out from the condemned man's cell brought across the road, and here is where they met their end. One week later, on the 16th of January, 14 men were hanged in one single day. The first seven were hanged at 11 a.m. The next seven were hanged at 1 p.m. In one single day in York's history, 14 wives were widowed and 57 children were made fatherless. To get back up onto the city walls, you cross over Skeldergate Bridge, which was opened in 1881 to the public. It's actually only the second bridge to be built across the river after Ouse Bridge, which is a long-standing one. And I'll tell you about that here. So the bridge that you can see down there is the Ouse Bridge, which is one of the oldest bridges in York. That current bridge is actually Victorian, but there has been a bridge on that site since the Romans were here in the first century. On the right of the river, that area is known as King's Stafe. On the left, it's known as Queen's Stafe. And it's there that in 1586, Margaret Clitheroe was executed for being a Catholic at a time when it was illegal during the reign of Elizabeth I. She was actually pressed to death. A large wooden door was placed on her chest and stones were placed on top. Gradually, she was being crushed slowly to her death. And she expired just on the left bank there. She's now known as Saint Margaret Clitheroe and down the shambles, there is actually a shrine dedicated to her memory. 
But we have another saint here in York, St. William of York, who was the Archbishop and in 1153 made a triumphant return to the city, having previously been exiled by the Pope. And he sailed up the river towards Ouse Bridge. Hundreds had gathered on the bridge to see his great return. And as such, the bridge actually collapsed under their weight. They all fell into the water. But the Archbishop was there to pray that nobody was injured. Nobody was, nobody died. It was heralded as a miracle. Just one year later, when the Archbishop was giving mass in York Minster, he said he died, possibly from a poisoned chalice at the mass. As such, he was verified and his body was interred at York Minster. A shrine was built around him. It was said that miracles had been performed at this shrine and as such, he was canonized and became our saint. As you come across Skelda Gate Bridge, you'll find the walls again. Your access is through this recreation of a gateway built here by the Victorians. And this is the entrance into what is Bale Hill. It was, once upon a time, the second castle here in York built by William the Conqueror. Nothing remains here of this day other than the Bailey, which is why it takes its name, Bale Hill. Just like Clifford's Tower, the castle here again would have been a wooden structure, but there's no real record of it from the 11th century onwards. So it was only stood here for a few years at least. But we're making our way on the final stretch of wall towards Micklegate Bar, but not before I've got one final gruesome story to tell you. This tower marks the southwest corner of the fortress. The home straight back to Micklegate Bar is just within sight in that direction. But this tower was actually known as Bitch Daughter Tower. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I did say Bitch Daughter Tower. It's not actually the meaning that you think of. Bitch is actually the old medieval term meaning nightmare or bad. Deteur, or daughter, as we've changed it into, is actually the French, that means dormitory. So technically, this is known as the nightmare dormitory. And the reason being is because it's at the southwest edge. It gets hit full force by the cold north wind. Anyone who's in the room below, it wouldn't have been very pleasant for them at all. There is some talk that this was actually used for a time as a prison cell, an oubliette, as it were. An oubliette is actually the French for forgotten. You basically leave people in here to rot. But during the Civil War and the Siege of York in 1644, it was actually used as the guard's outpost. So again, you really didn't want to be stationed as a watchman right here on this tower. But I want to draw your attention to just outside the city wall. This area is known as Clementhorpe, and in the 15th century, there was actually a nunnery just over the other side here. It was surrounded by barley fields, and it's in this barley field that Archbishop Richard Scroop was executed. But it wasn't just a straightforward execution. You see, he had rebelled against King Henry IV, and as punishment, he was to be publicly executed in this field, he actually requested to be hacked to death with five blows of the axe. The five blows to signify the five wounds of Christ. He was made to ride a donkey backwards and unsaddled through the city centre as an even more public humiliation. He was eventually led out to the barley fields here where he awaited his fate. It said that even the spectators of his worst enemies couldn't bear to watch what was happening. But unlike his other fellow traitors, 
who had their heads spiked on Micklegate Bar, the Archbishop was to suffer another fate. He was actually to be reinterred at York Minster with his head placed under his arm. But the king thought he'd got rid of his troublesome priest. But even in death, he proved to be a challenge. You see, because he was laid at York Minster, that became a site of pilgrimage. And people from all the way around the country came to see this famous archbishop. It was said that miracles had been performed at his tomb, so much so that there was call for him to be canonized. King Henry IV was not happy. Just a few years after the execution, King Henry suffered an awful fate himself. He began to be afflicted by a terrible skin condition that caused his skin to blister like it was burning on fire. Pustules would erupt on his face, causing severe disfigurement. He actually thought this was punishment from the archbishop in the afterlife. The king died of this horrible disease. Even on his deathbed, he was still blaming the archbishop. But we're going to make our way back to where we began this entire tour, back towards Micklegate Bar, Traitor's Bar, where I can tell you one last spooky story. So here we are, back where we started from back at Micklegate Bar. Now, some people believe that Micklegate Bar is in fact haunted. So I'm gonna leave you with this lovely bedtime story. The story goes that in the 18th century, the gate master used to live here at Micklegate Bar with his family, with a young daughter named Sarah Brocklebank. Now, as with any child, she used to play about the place and often played with her father's keys. But one time when she did play with the keys, she lost them and never found them. Unfortunately, because of this, the gatekeeper lost his job and he and his family were turfed out onto the streets. Years later, after he had passed away and his wife had died and Sarah was an old woman, the Lord Mayor of the city was holding a banquet at the mansion house in the centre of town and he had his guests around him in the banqueting hall when in burst Sarah. I remember, I remember where I left the keys. And she promptly dropped dead. Those keys were never found. But it is said that if you're in Micklegate Bar by yourself, you can actually hear the jangle of keys somewhere in the distance. Sarah supposedly haunts the building still searching for her father's missing keys. So there we have it. We've completed our medieval walled adventure. I do hope you have enjoyed my tales of beheadings and hangings, skeletons and graveyards, battles and rebellions, murder and ghosts, and a drunk monk. But I have only just scratched the surface with some of the gruesome stories that York has to offer. If you'd like to know more, you can join me, Mad Alice, in person on the bloody tour of York that runs evenings throughout the year. But until we meet in the flesh, I do wish you the bloodiest of dreams.